Okay, I'm going to get started. I wanted just to begin with um, some remarks about the test, test one. So uh, the sc scores are posted. Make sure you can see your score is posted. Um, most of the exams were returned in yesterday's recitation class. If you took your exam with DRC, uh, I have your exam. Um, I posted online, it's posted here on the slide, uh, the distribution of scores on test one and the average for test one. And also, I, I, the lower plot here is the distribution of your current scores in the course as compared to um, the, the letter grades um, for, for the course. So I, I hope that's useful. Um, if you have any questions, or queries on the grading for your test, then please do come and see, you can come and see me. Um, uh, you could just send me an email or drop by my office 309 in this building or, or see your recitation instructor. But please make sure if you've got a query or a question on the grading that you get that sorted out. Um, also, if you felt that you didn't do as well as you wanted to do or should have done on the test, also make sure you talk to either me or your recitation instructor because we might be able to give you some um, help or advice on, on taking the next, next test. Um, don't imagine, right, don't imagine, for example, that I went through physics getting A's on every one of my tests. I did not do that. Um, I famously did really badly on some tests. And so um, we, we, you know, I'm trying to say that if you're worried about how you did on test two, make sure you come and see, see one of us. Okay. Any questions on all that before I, before I go on? Okay. So today's class we're moving on to a, a new topic, uh, and it's the topic that we'll cover over, I think it's about the ne next eight or nine lectures, a and it's the topics for test two. It's, um, it's magnetism and electromagnetism. So we're going to add to electricity magnetism and electromagnetism. On this slide is today's content. I want to talk about magnetic interactions to start with, attractions and repulsions. We'll move on to the notion of magnetic poles, magnetic south poles and magnetic north poles. We'll then move on to the, the concept of, of magnetic fields carrying magnetic forces. And finally, we'll introduce and look at some illustrations, examples of the, the field equation for magnetic forces. So th this is the plan for today. Um, this is one class that's covering two and a half thousand years of work on magnetism. And so, you know, these four steps here from basically magnetic rocks upstairs here to magnetic north and south poles, the magnetic fields to the field equation actually took two and a half thousand years to accomplish, but we'll just do it in um, just over an hour. So this is just to get us going. Uh, on the left, I put a couple of remarks about electricity, and on the right, a couple of corresponding marks, uh, remarks about magnetism. So the first documentation of magnetic interactions actually like the first documentation of uh, electrical interactions, goes back to the ancient Greeks and goes back two and a half thousand years. So the ancient Greeks in electricity observed that um, amber, this, this uh, resin used in jewelry, if rubbed would attract light objects like hair or feathers or straw. And that was really the beginnings of electricity. Uh, 
the ancient Greeks also discovered and, and documented that there were certain types of rocks, certain types of natural materials, the famous one is magnetite, certain types of rocks that would at attract one another. Magnetite would attract other magnetite rocks. Magnetite would attract things like uh, metals, like iron. And that was the beginning of magnetism. Since those early beginnings, you know, today we now understand that this strange attraction of amber for hair and straw and wool is actually a manifestation of a fundamental force of nature, the electrical force of nature, and that um, matter, material, is made out of electrical building blocks. And likewise, um, this, this first observation of, of magnetic rocks and magnetic materials, we now understand that that was a magnet, uh, manifestation of um, the magnetic force, another fundamental force of nature, and that actually uh, the uh, magnetic interactions of materials are also a kind of glimpse at the, um, the, the magnetic components, that the, the magnetic building blocks that the materials are made of. And so that's the, that's the kind of the entire summary of our story here on this slide. Is magnetism interesting? Is it important? I mentioned some of this before. I, I think I'm going to argue it is interesting. It is important to us. And here are four reasons. We'll start up on the top left and work our way down here to the bottom right. Uh, four reasons it was important. First reason is that magnetism has saved our lives. Without the Earth's magnetic field, there'd just be cockroaches on Earth because none of us could survive the cosmic radiation that's heading towards the Earth. The magnetic field that's created by the magnetic Earth is kind of an umbrella, a shield, that uh, saves us from that deadly cosmic radiation. So we have to thank... Um, Earth's magnetism for saving our lives. This is, a, this is actually a, a, the Earth's magnetic field. Um, another reason that um, magnetism was very important, magnetism played a huge role in the exploration, this is going back hundreds of years now, um, exploration of the Earth and the discovery of the continents of the Earth. It was magnetism that gave us the compass, the compass needle, the magnetic compass that allowed, allowed voyagers, explorers to get on a ship and have some chance of coming back home because they had a compass with them so that they knew where we, they were going and they knew the way home. So that was actually a, a hu the, the, the magnetic compass was a huge event in, um, in history and it relies again on understanding some properties of magnetism that the compass needle points north um, and that the compass needle points north because it's immersed in the magnetic field of the earth. Okay, another point, why is magnetism important? Um, all the electricity that we use, we're constantly using electricity, it's, it's, it's created well, it's created often by motion of something, but that motion is turned into electricity um, by, by devices called generators, which are mag uh, magnetic devices. So without magnetism, we would have no electrical power outlets. We would have no electricity in our home. Magnetism is the key to generating electricity, and so we have to thank, uh, thank the understanding of magnetism for this. Um, and then finally, um, as my daughter said, this is by far and away the most important reason for magnetism. Um, it, it's that all this data that we created, and I, I don't know what all the websites are or whatever, um, but uh, all that data is stored magnetically. Every bit of data, an exabit, just to let you know, is a billion billion bits. And we have tens of, stored tens of thousands of exabits of data, and it's all stored magnetically. And so uh, there's been a huge importance of magnetism in saving all the data that we are now, all the information that we're now creating. 
There's also a huge scientific importance of magnetism. Over the last few hundred years in physics, there were two great unifications. So there are two great unifications, or two great revolutions. What were they? Um, one of them was due to uh, Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton's unification was that he unified um, everyday terrestrial motion under gravity with celestial motion of things like the moon around the earth or the earth around the sun. He unified those two types of motion. He explained those two types of what were thought to be completely different types of motion through a single force, the force of gravity. The second great unification in physics was maybe about 150 years ago, and it was the unification of electricity that we've been talking about up to test one with magnetism. So the material for test two. And much of what we'll be talking about over the next lectures leading towards test two is that it is developing the understanding that electricity and magnetism are connected to one another. They're actually unified in what's called electromagnetism. And that's the second great unification in physics. And so um, magnetism, its unification of electricity was tremendously important in uh, scientific understanding. I was really pleased to see, actually, <laughs> I'm watching the Super Bowl, uh, of course, um, and I'm watching the Super Bowl, and Isaac Newton and Maxwell were features in the Pfizer Super Bowl advert. So that, I thought that was kind of nice to see. Um, anyway, let's get on with the materi material for today's class. I want to talk about North Poles and South Poles, magnetic North Poles and South Poles. Um, and then we're going to talk about magnetic fields, the notion of fields, and then the field equation. Those are the re real key things. So magnetic poles. I'll show you an example of this, but um, in, in understanding magnetism, we, we develop the notion of um, magnetic poles, magnetic north poles and south poles. It's kind of like in understanding electricity, we develop the, you know, the concept of charges and positive and negative charges. Uh, in the case of magnetism, if you have two like poles, so and two north poles, they will repel one another. Two south poles, they will repel one another. If you have a north pole and a south pole, or vice versa, then, um, then they'll attract one another. If you think about it, that's exactly like uh, electricity. In electricity, if you have two like charges, two positive charges, they repel one another. If you have two unlike charges, pair of negative charges, they repel one another. If you have a positive charge and a negative charge, they will, um, they will attract one another. So there's a big parallel here between magnetic north-south poles and uh, electric uh, positive and, and negative charges. I want to I show you um, this attraction and repulsion. So I'm going to put it on the camera so we can all see it. Okay, so you're seeing the camera viewing the bench here. And um, remember back to that lecture one. Rem let's reminisce about that for a little bit. Remember I had a nylon rod and I had a glass rod and I, I came with other props. I had a piece of cat's fur and some silk. And I would rub the nylon or the glass with the cat's fur or the silk. Um, and I would show you the attraction and repulsion the electrical attraction and repulsion. So I'm going to do the same thing now, except this is a magnetic, not an electric attraction and repulsion. I've got um, two bar magnets. Here's one of them. I'm going to leave the other one here. Um, one end is red, one end is blue. That's just to indicate to us that the red end is the north pole and the blue end is the south pole. So both these magnets have these two ends that are opposite polarities, a north pole and a south pole. And uh, we're just going to 
we're just going to explore the uh, attractions and repulsions between a pair of magnets. And so I got a, I got a magnet here on the, um, whatever this device is called. Um, uh, I've got it on that device because it's free to move. It's free to move. And I'm going to show you the attraction and the repulsion, the magnetic attraction and repulsion. So firstly, over here on the right is the south pole. And I'm going to bring up the south pole of this magnet. And, you know, I, only got, I got a few inches away and they just ran away from me. And um, when you think about this, it's almost sort of magical. It's very strange that I don't need to touch the two poles together to create this quite substantial repulsion between the pair. And so that's magnetic repulsion between a pair of light poles. Um, the other case would be the two north poles. They also repel one another. So just to show you, I'll bring up the north pole or in my hand to the other north pole and we get repulsion. Look, I can send it back the other direction. I can break it and send it back this way. It's quite amazing. And then there was attraction. So if I bring up the north pole to the south pole, it will attract it. And that's the magnetic attraction. And likewise, if I bring up my south pole to the north pole, it will attract it. And so that's um, magnetic attraction and repulsion. We think of it in terms of magnetic north poles and south poles. It parallels electric attraction and repulsion and parallels uh, positive and negative charges. There is a difference, though. You might have noticed a difference. So the difference is that when I showed you attraction and repulsion in electricity, I would charge up a glass rod, I would charge up a, a plastic rod. The glass rod, I can, I can never remember which way around it, but let's pretend it was negative. The plastic rod, it would be positive. And two glass rods would repel one another, and two plastic rods would repel one another, but a glass and a plastic would attract one another. This is a little bit different because I can exhibit attraction and repulsion, you know, by just turning these rods around. These rods have both the north and south pole. They, they can exhibit both the attraction and repulsion, whereas with the uh, electrical attraction and repulsion, I just had a positive rod or a negative rod. And so I had to use different combinations of rods to show you the attraction and repulsion. So that, that is a difference. Okay, um, I forgot for a moment what I was doing there. Got sidetracked. Yes? Um, are, there, is, are there any cases where you can have like, a good attractor but bad repulsor or vice versa? Um, you mean a material? Yeah. Uh, that's actually a very good question. So um, there are a small number of materials that can be permanently magnetized. So magnetize that rock that it was naturally occurring would attract and repel. Uh, so that's a natural material. Um, these, uh, these are iron magnets. Uh, they can be magnetized and attract and repel and, sh and show this strong attraction and repulsion. Most materials um, are not magnetic. So l like, um, I can't pick up the chair with the magnet. Uh, I can't... Um, you know, pick up your iPad or whatever the way that, so most materials are actually non-magnetic. Non um, so th there's definitely a magnetic and non-magnetic materials. Now, I think you were specifically asking, could you have a strong attraction but a weak repulsion or some combination like that? I, I, I'm tempted to say no to that. I think if you've got a, the thing is, if you've got a North Pole, you're going to have a South Pole. 
You can't have a North Pole without a South Pole and vice versa. And so I think you can't have a you know, strong attraction without strong repulsion, repulsion and vice versa. But that's an interesting question. Okay, we want to talk about magnetic fields. So this is now going to be jumping forward a bit in history, way forward, 2,000 years forward. Um, so a, a big jump. Um, just like, just like um, the electrical force, the electrical attraction repulsion was conveyed by um, electrical fields, uh, the magnetic attraction and repulsion is conveyed by magnetic fields. So underneath the surface of the electrical magnetic interactions in both cases is an electrical magnetic field. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. Here are uh, upstairs and downstairs just two sketches on the left hand side of the electric field of a well-known arrangement of charges and the magnetic field of a well-known arrangement of magnetic poles. So uh, this one we talked about before. Upstairs there's a positive and negative charge in the neighborhood of one another and that creates a surrounding electrical field and we sketched it with electrical field lines. This is sort of a similar situation downstairs here but a magnetic case. In this particular case uh, we've got a, um, a north pole and a south pole rather than a positive and negative charge but we've got a surrounding magnetic field and we've sketched the magnetic field lines. And actually if you look at the two patterns, the one for the electric field upstairs, the magnetic field downstairs, you do see a lot of similarities. So upstairs here, the, the positive end of the arrangement, the field lines are kind of coming out of that end of the arrangement. Over here on the right, the negative end of the arrangement, the field lines are going in towards the negative charge. The similar thing is happening down here. At the north pole, right, that, that the field lines are coming out of the end of the North Pole on this magnet. And the field lines are returning, uh, heading back in towards the South Pole on this magnet. And so there is a lot of similarity here. This arrangement upstairs, if you remember, we called that an electric dipole. Dipole is kind of two, di, and it's a, a positive and negative charge. This is a magnetic dipole, two again for di, and it's a, a North Pole and a South Pole. So it's a pair of poles here. In both cases, we've got opposite charges here, opposite poles here. Uh, but there is a interesting, bit more subtle difference between the, the field lines, the electric field lines and that, their pattern, and the magnetic field lines and their, their pattern. In the case of the electric field lines, the, the positive charge is actually the source of field lines. So field lines are sprouting out of it. Uh, and the negative charge, that's what we call the sink. The sink of the electric field lines. The field lines are draining into it. So field lines in the electrical case have beginnings. They emerge from the positive charge. They have endings. They disappear. They vanish into the negative charge. If you look at the magnetic field case, that's not actually the case. The field lines here, it's a little hard for me to draw it. I kind of messed it up a bit. But the field lines, it's meant to show that they're loops. They're continuous loops. So this field line here, for example, loops around. It moves over here a bit, but, and then heads back. And all of the field lines form continuous loops. So uh, whilst field lines are coming out of the North Pole end and heading into the South Pole end, they don't vanish. The North Pole and the South Pole are not kind of the beginnings and the ends of the field lines. They're not what we call the sources and sinks of field lines. Rather, the field lines just form continuous loops. There are actually no beginnings and ends of magnetic field lines. So that's very important. So, and that is a big difference. Okay, I just wanted to show you, because it's so important to us, the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field <coughs> is a magnetic dipole field. So the Earth has a magnetic north pole, has a magnetic south pole. It has field lines that emerge out of the Earth at the north pole, and it emerge back into the Earth 
at the South Pole. Now, there's a couple of interesting things about it. Firstly, just to confuse everyone again, the magnetic North Pole is actually at the geographic South Pole. And the magnetic South Pole is at the geographic North Pole. So th that's a good start. Um, so the geographic poles, you know, up here is the Arctic and down here is the Antarctic, uh, are reversed compared to the um, magnetic North and South Poles. The, the magnetic North Pole is at the Arctic and the um, magnetic South Pole and the magnetic North Pole is at the Antarctic and the magnetic South Pole is at the Arctic. So that's one thing that's different. Another thing, just let's create more confusion while we're at it. Um, you might think, oh, okay, the poles are the other way around, but um, the, the, the rotation of the Earth, which defines the geographic poles, and the, um, uh, the Earth's magnetic field, which defines the uh, magnetic poles, at least they're on the same axis. But actually, they're not even on the same axis. The, um, the uh, magnetic axis of its north and south poles is about 11 de degrees away from the, um, the geographic, the rotation axis. So they're not even perfectly aligned. So the, the geographic north pole is in the neighborhood of the magnetic north south pole, but not exactly at its location. And, and vice versa, the geographic south pole is um, near the magnetic north pole, but not exactly at its location. So that's one more confusion. Uh, another sort of amazing thing is that um, over time, so I've marked on this diagram 11 degrees. 11 degrees between the two axes, between the geographic axis and the magnetic axis. But actually, that 11 degrees changes. So the, the, the magnetic, so it's getting even worse. The magnetic North Pole kind of wanders around in some way. And actually, over very long time scales, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years, the, the magnetic poles have actually even reversed. So if we went back a million years ago, the, the, the magnetic North Pole was actually at the geographic North Pole, and the magnetic South Pole was actually at the geographic South Pole. Um, so the, 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 the magnetism of the Earth is, when you look at it in detail, is quite complicated. It is wandering around. It is flipping backwards and forwards on large time scales. It is due to inside the very center of the Earth, there's this hot, dense region of iron, liquid iron, that's kind of boiling and rotating around in this turbulent fashion. It's creating this magnetic field, but it's a very active thing. And that's why it can flip. That's why it can move around. Anyway, that's the Earth. Let me show you a few magnetic fields. I'm going to show you on the, the device that I remembered the name of, document camera. So that's good. <clears throat> I've got a little clear plastic box. Inside this um, clear plastic box is some, some sort of oil. Um, and inside the oil, you can't see it yet, is little tiny iron filings. Thousands of little tiny iron filings. If I, if I sh shake it up and put it on here, you kind of get uh, a picture of it. Uh, lots of little black dots in here. Uh, in this clear oil, they're all iron filings. What I'm going to do is these boxes I can stick a magnet in. So I've got two magnets here. Here's, here's one of the magnets. It's very small. It's hard for you to see, but there's a north pole and a south pole on this magnet. And I'm just going to throw it in this kind of weird soup of oil and iron filings. Not a soup by, and not tomato soup. I wouldn't eat this one. Um, but I'm going to put the magnet in there, and let's just watch what happens. No. 
What's happening is that those iron filings are immersed in the magnetic field of the bar magnet. Those iron filings get magnetized themselves in the magnetic field of the bar magnet. The iron, magnetized iron filings tend to want to move to where the field is stronger. So they're going to move towards the bar magnet. The iron filings tend to want to line up with, orientate with, the magnetic field that they're immersed in. So the magnetic filings end up mapping out for us the field lines of the, magnetic, uh, of the bar magnet. Over here is one of the poles. And over here is the other one of the poles. And you can kind of see the field lines are on one end, they must be emerging out from, uh, say, the North Pole. And on the other end, they're returning into the magnet, into the South Pole. And you see the pattern of the field lines. This is just like the pattern I showed you in the sketch of the, um, of the magnetic dipole. This is just like the pattern I showed you in the sketch of the North Pole and the South Pole of a bar magnet. So we're actually, we're actually seeing that. I'll show you another couple of pictures because it's a little clearer on the picture. This is, oh yeah, thank you. I've already forgotten how to do that. I looked it up actually. This is, because uh, uh, I was claiming that was uh, Pavlov's dog or something because I know nothing about this stuff. But it, it's not Pavlov's dog because Pavlov's dog would salivate when Pavlov came in the lab. Um, and this is more like, um, of course you guys know this much better than I, this must be that other type of conditioning where after the event, I'm either punished or rewarded to, to put on the, um, the document camera. Anyway, I don't think you wanted to hear all that, but um, let's go to the slides. Here we are. So this is a pair of magnets, like the the magnet we just saw, and um, they're immersed in some fluid, uh, some oil that contains iron filings, and we're seeing the um, pattern of the field lines due to the two magnets. In this particular case, I got two magnets with their no north poles, so light poles, facing each other. So here's a north pole upstairs, here's a north pole downstairs, and you see the field lines emerging from the north poles, but just like the North Poles uh, are repelled from one another, they experience a force, it's as if the field lines, too, are pushed away from one another. And so you see the, the field lines from the top magnet being bent away uh, from the uh, bottom magnet, the field lines from the bottom magnet being bent away from the top ma magnet. I, I can show you the reverse case. This is, again, we've got a, a, a magnet upstairs here, magnet downstairs here. Now I've got the top magnet south pole facing the bottom magnet's north pole. Again, they're immersed in this fluid, some oil, with all these iron filings in it. Now you see the, um, the field lines that are emerging from the north pole of the bottom magnet they're attracted to the south pole of the top magnet. So not only is there an, an attractive force here between the opposite poles, but really the field lines that emerge from the north pole are uh, pulled in towards the south pole of the, um, the upper magnet here. And so this is, again, mapping out the pattern of field lines in this region of magnetic poles. OK. I wanted to stress, before we move on to the field equation, um, no idea what that is. Anyway, I wanted to stress before we go on to the... Oh, that's better. Before we go on to the field equation, this key difference between um, magnetic fields and electric fields. So electric fields, remember the, the positive and negative charges were the beginnings and the endings of the field lines. With uh, magnetic fields, there are no beginnings and endings of field lines. Rather, the magnetic field lines just form loops. So we would say, sort of more technically, 
we would say that in electricity there are sources and sinks of electric field lines, the charges. In magnetism there are no sources and sinks of magnetic field lines. The magnetic field lines uh, just, just, produce, um, just produce loops. Another way we would say it is that in electricity uh, positive and negative charges are the sources and sinks of electric flux. Uh, in magnetism, there are actually no sources or sinks of electrical flux. There are just sources of loops of field lines, uh, circles of field lines. Technically, we call it circulation of field lines. Okay. Well, all that was words to describe magnetic attractions, repulsion attraction, and attraction, um, and w words to describe uh, magnetic poles, and like poles repel, and unlike poles attract. And then the concept of the notion of fields as conveying these, these magnetic forces. I now want to move on to a, a, an equation to describe it, so get more quantitative. In the electrical case, we met the field equation, which described the relationship between the electrical field and the electrical force, and the thing that experiences electrical fields, electrical charge. We're going to do the same thing in the magnetic case. We're going to write down the magnetic field equation, which describes the relationship between the, um, the magnetic field and the magnetic force, and the thing in magnetism that experiences um, magnetic forces. So we're going to explore all that. So on this slide, there's too many words, I think, actually, in hindsight. Um, but I, I wanted to just say some general statement about the nature of field equations. So the electrical field equation was that F, electric force, equals um, Q, electrical charge, times E, the electrical field. That was the uh, electrical field equation. It describes the relationship between the um, uh, electrical force, electrical field, and electrical charge. There is also a, a gravitational field equation. It just looks the same thing. And then we're going to be now exploring the magnetic field equation. And I, I'm saying a few words about it because the magnetic field equation in some sense is similar and in some senses different. And so I wanted to stress the similarities and the differences before we actually go on to work, work with the equation. So, um, firstly, the field equations, the electrical field equation describes how um, the forces, electrical forces, um, are carried by, are mediated by an electrical field, uh, and, and it describes the property that experiences uh, or feels the electrical field, so that's the charge. The, the electrical field equation has a kind of mathematical form to it, and this is going to be important to us. The, it, it, it itself is a, a, a relationship between the force, the field, and some property of nature, charge. But the mathematical form that I want to measure, m mention is that the force is a vector, the field is a vector, the charge is a scalar. So if you, were, if you were a mathematician, God forbid, if you are a mathematician and you looked at the field equation, you'd be thinking, oh, this is a vector equals a scalar times a vector. That's the nature of that equation. Uh, and I'm mentioning that because that's important for uh, our magnetic field equation. Now, b because the magnetic force vector is equal to a scalar times an electrical field vector, that actually implies that tells you that the electrical force must either point in the same direction as the field, if it was a positive charge, or it must point in the opposite direction to the field, if it was a negative charge. So uh, mathematicians are looking at that equation, and, and they're noting the fact that the equation has the form of a vector equals a scalar times a vector, and they're noting the fact that the Vector force, therefore, must be in the direction of or opposite the direction of the field. And that's a very characteristic feature of, of ele electrical forces and electrical fields. Okay, so the magnetic field equation, now in, in, in this, whatever this color is here, 
don't know the name. Uh, it, whatever this color, maroon. Uh, the magnetic field equation uh, describes how um, the magnetic force is carried by, mediated by, the magnetic field. And it also describes the property that experiences or feels the magnetic field. It's actually not charge, it's charge times velocity. It's moving charge. So this quantity is a measure of moving charge. That's what actually feels experiencing experiences the magnetic field. This equation, so now I, I'm a, become a mathematician, and I'm interested in the, 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 the nature, the form of this equation. Uh, the magnetic field equation also has this, it also is an equation that looks like the force equals some property of nature, the moving charge, times the field, the magnetic field. But in this case, the force is a vector, the property of nature is a vector, moving charge. So that's got a direction to it. And the field is a vector too. And so that is a key difference between how the field equation works in electricity, where the electric field points in the direction of, or opposite the direction of, the electrical field. How the field equation works in magnetism, where we'll see that it, because there's two vectors on the right-hand side of the field equation, it's much more complicated in what direction the magnetic field points. Okay, so that was just to alert us to that. Okay. So, on this slide, I'm comparing the magnetic field equation, it's going to be upstairs, with the electric field, sorry, I'm comparing the magnetic and electric field equations. The electric field equation is upstairs, the magnetic field equation is downstairs. And so we're comparing the top, something we already know, the bottom, uh, this is the new, new person. Um, so here's the electrical field equation, and I've just written it in terms of symbols, and I've written out its units, is that the electrical force is equal to the product of the charge in the electrical field. This is the magnetic field equation. The magnetic field equation says that the, um, the magnetic force is the product of QV. Remember, that's representing the moving charge. So this is, you know, what experiences, what feels the force, ties the magnetic field, that's what's carrying the force, and then there's this extra bit, sine theta. This extra bit is coming in because in the electric field equation, on the right-hand side, we just had one direction. And um, the, the field was either in that direction or force was either in that direction or opposite that direction. In the magnetic field equation, we got two directions. So now, now we're panicking. What do we do with the two directions? We got the direction of the moving charge. We got the direction of the magnetic field. We're going to see what we do with it. But part of what we do with it is that the magnetic force is, in addition, being proportioned to this property, QV, and the magnetic field. There's a sine theta in here. And that theta is the angle that theta is the angle between the two directions, between the direction of the moving charge and the direction of the, of the magnetic field. And so that's a, that's a key extra ingredient. There's no such thing up here. In the electrical case, as I said, the electrical field was either in the direction or opposite the direction the electrical force is in the direction opposite the direction of the electrical field. In the magnetic case, the, electrical, the magnetic force is actually at right angles, at 90 degrees, to both the directions over here on the right-hand side, both the direction of the moving particle and the direction of the magnetic field. Okay. So I think that's, um, that's a lot to swallow, uh, is my feeling about it. Um, I, I, th I think it is a, a lot to accept in a way that there's this very strange field equation for magnetism that actually depends on the motion of the uh, particle, the, the, the movement of the charged particle. Uh, so the next slides are really about applying it, using it, and kind of getting used to it. You know, when you, you try some new food, I don't know.
Uh, and, you know, to begin with, you're not quite sure about it. But then after you've tried it for a bit, you've eaten squid for the past week or whatever, um, you're kind of getting more used to it. And so that's the goal now, is to get used to this equation. So here's a picture to get us going. On this picture, I, is this a really a picture of the field equation? So if I could draw, if I and write down that field equation, but I can also make a picture of a field equation. And the field equation for magnetism, on the right-hand side, there's the magnetic field and there's the moving charge particle. So in red here is the motion of the charge particle, represented by this vector here, this red vector, this red arrow. In green here, here's the uh, magnetic field that is moving in, represented by the green arrow, the green vector. Uh, I've indicated theta on here. Remember, this was important in the field equation. It appears in the field equation. Is the angle between the direction of the field and the direction of the motion. And then finally, in blue, I've indicated the magnetic force that results from this moving charge particle in this magnetic field. Notice that this force in blue is at right angles to the velocity vector. So that, that's this big right angle I drew here. And then it's also at right angles to the magnetic field vector. That's this little right angle I drew here. And so that's a key thing about the direction of the force. It's at right angles to the direction of the two other vectors that are ingredients in the field equation. The motion, the movement, the velocity, and the, um, the field, the field carrying the force. So that, that gets us a little bit used to this strange equation. And I say, think of this as the picture. I think that this is a picture book, right? Now, we've met the field equation. That's the text. Here's the picture of the field equation. This pictures the relationship between F, V, and B. Uh, there's a couple of interesting special cases of the field equation. And often... We, we meet these special cases. So in general, the field equation is F equals Q, V, B, sine theta. In a couple of special cases, and I'll talk about it, um, it's simplified. And often we meet these simplified cases. So one of the simplified cases is, w is when the, that angle theta between the velocity vector and the magnetic field, when that's 90 degrees. That's a special case. When you've got the magnetic field and the motion are right angles to one another. They're perpendicular to one another. There's 90 degrees between them. In that particular case, sine theta is going to be 1 because sine of 90 degrees is 1. In that particular case, the field equation morphs into F equals just QVB. Now, I, I mentioned that you know, I mention it because often we end up dealing with motion that's perpendicular to the field. So often when we solve a problem, and when you solve a problem, you'll, you'll be working with F equals QVB. But we should remember it is a particular case, a special case, of when the motion and the field are at right angles to one another. There's another special case. This is really interesting, I think. Supposing the motion, V, and the magnetic field are in the same direction. So I've got two vectors here, my two arms, and one's V and one's B, and supposing they were in the same direction. Or actually, supposing they were in opera country. Need more yoga. <laughs> God forbid. Um, uh, they're in opposite directions. Um, in those two cases of same direction and opposite direction for the two vectors, um, well, theta would be 0 degrees or 180 degrees, and sine of 0 degrees and 180 degrees is 0. This is an amazing thing. If you move in the direction of the magnetic field, or you move opposite the direction of the magnetic field, the magnetic force actually vanishes on you. It goes away completely. Isn't, isn't that strange? I think that's super. Um, so the, the, the magnetic field vanishes if you're traveling in the direction of the field lines or you're traveling opposite the direction of the field lines. The magnetic field, vine, field force vanishes if you move along the field lines, basically. So that's another special case, and sometimes we'll meet that. Here's a rule for the field equation. Again, all these are pictures of the field equation. 
The rule is called the right hand rule, and so make sure to use your right hand. Uh, you get everything reversed if you use the left hand. So got to uh, lefties, I'm lefty, but you got to use your right hand here. Um, what you're going to do? There's various versions of this rule too. So I'm going to show you one in the book. I think that I, they show you more, so you can pick the one you like. But I'm going to I'm going to show you this one. Remember the equation is f equals q v b sine theta. So um, reading through the equation, there's a force on the left-hand side, and then there's the two vectors. First, v, the velocity, on the sorry, I said the force is on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, there's two vectors. There's the force v. Gosh, there's the velocity v, and then there's a magnetic field b. So we're going to meet those three things. You point your palm of your right hand in the direction of the velocity. So in this case, the red velocity vector is going over towards the left-hand side of the room. So I'm pointing the palm of my right hand towards the left-hand side of the room, because that's the motion. You curl your fingers in the only way they'll curl. You curl your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field. So the magnetic field in this sketch is coming out of the screen towards you. So I'm curling my fingers out of the screen towards you. Your thumb then points in the direction of the force on a, on a positively charged moving particle. So if I had a proton going this direction, if I was a proton going this direction, in a magnetic field that was going towards you, then I would be being pushed upwards towards the ceiling. That's the right hand rule. And that's another picture. It's even better than a picture. It's a prop. It's a prop of the, um, the field equation. It's fantastic. It's like a puppet show of the field equations. OK. You, oh, a note here. I want to say this. You have to be careful about negative charges. This rule, hand is the velocity. Fingers curl towards the magnetic field. Thumb points in the direction of the force. It's a force on a positive charged particle. If it was a negative charged particle, if now become an electron, then the force is in the opposite direction. Remember, the electron has a minus sign rather than a plus sign. That's why that happens. And so this rule is for a positive charge. You've got to flip the direction of the force for a negative charge, just like you would flip the direction of the electrical force for a negative charge compared to a positive charge. OK. A few practice cases. See if we can do these. Um, OK, so in this picture, we've got a, so this picture is stressing that difference between positive and negative charges. I've got a field that's, that's basically going from the left to the right. I've got a positive charged particle heading up, and I've got a negative charged particle heading upwards. And the question is, what is the direction of the forces on this, uh, these two upward going charges, one plus and one minus, in this left to right field. So let's see if we can do this. Firstly, we're always going to be pushing, um, putting our hands upwards because that's the direction of the velocity vector. So I start this way around. Uh, then I've got to curl my uh, fingers in the direction of the magnetic field. So the only way I can reasonably do that is to bend, turn my hand around this way and curl my fingers from left to right. Uh, my thumb is now pointing in towards the screen. So that would be the direction of the force on a positive charged particle in towards the screen. Um, negative charged particle, we've got to reverse it. It's got a minus sign, not a plus sign. So uh, that uh, negative charged particle or electron, it would be out of the screen. And so that's what's shown on this, on this plot here. It's all based on the right-hand rule. Applying the right-hand rule to this positive charged particle is pushed in towards the screen. This negative charged particle is pushed out of the screen. What am I doing? OK, so more examples. I don't know why I put that in there, because they're already doing examples. So I'm going to do more examples. Let's, let's see if we can do these. Um, I might not do all of them. But uh, anyway, let's start up here on the top left. And we'll walk across the um, top row. And then we'll walk downstairs here. And um, let's, see, let's see how we get on with this. So, top row, top, top um, left, the 
velocity vector in red of this charged, positively charged particle is towards the right. So I'm, I'm sticking my fingers towards the right. Uh, and then the field, what direction is the field in? This is a little bit of notation here. When a field goes in towards the page or the screen or the overhead, we indicate that with crosses. When the field comes out of the screen or the page or the whatever, we indicate that with dots. So the first thing here is a little bit of um, coding that when a field goes into a page, it's dots. When a field comes out of the page, it's crosses. So that's what this example is training us to remember. Um, that crosses mean a field that's coming, going into the page. And if it were dots, it would be coming out of the page. OK, so go back to, um, we've got my hand that's pointing towards the right, because that's the motion. My fingers are going to curl in, because that's the direction of the field. Then my um, right thumb is pointing upwards. That's the direction of the force on that particle. That's the magnetic force on that positive charged particle. Um, let's do this other one upstairs here. So in this case, we've got a negative charged particle. It's going towards the left. So I'm pointing the palm of my right hand towards the left. The field is going upwards. So I've got to move my hand like this to point my fingers up. It's the only reasonable way of doing it. Um, and then my thumb, thumb would point in the direction of the force on a positive charged particle. So if it was a positive charged particle, it would be forced in towards the screen. But it's not a positive charged particle, it's a negatively charged particle, and so it's the opposite direction. So the, that negatively charged particle is being pushed out of the screen. What about this guy down here? What's the force in this case? This one's zero. Yeah, this one's zero, because it's parallel or in this case, opposite the field lines. If you travel along the field lines, either parallel to the field lines or opposite the field lines, then there is actually no magnetic force. So in this case, there's, there's no right-hand rule to fiddle with. Um, we just spot the fact that this is a geometry. This is an orientation of the motion with respect to the magnetic field that creates no magnetic force. It's this very funny thing about magnetism. So if uh, this case, the particle is moving towards the left, the field is towards the right, there's no magnetic force. And likewise, if the, the field was even towards the left and the particle is going towards the left, there'd be no magnetic, no magnetic fields in this case. Uh, this one might look more complicated. I mean, I, mean, I think that it, this one does look more complicated. But um, there's a couple of ways you could go about thinking about this one. Let me tell you one way. Look, this is a field that um, goes both from left to right and it goes from bottom to top. So it's got an um, a upwards component to it and a rightwards component to it. Actually, look, this field is this plus this, really. This is a right-going component. This is an upward-going component. This field is made out of putting together these two. So one way you could think about it is that this has a component towards the left, towards the right, and this is a component upwards. This, this one towards the right creates no, ma no magnetic force. Um, this one uh, upstairs would create a, 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 oh, actually, sorry, I, I didn't spot that this is going in the wrong, the other direction. So I gotta take all that back. This is, this is, made of those two components. It is made of these two components. This charged particle is heading up, and so the component that is upwards, that's going to create no magnetic force. It's only this component that's towards the, the right that will create a magnetic force. So we can, we can do it this way, by pointing the palm of our hand up, curl our fingers towards the right, and then my thumb will point in towards the screen, which will be the direction of the force on that moving charge particle. But we could have also just pointed our, the palm of our hand in the direction of the motion, upwards, and curled our fingers, you know, 
45 degrees, my thumb would have pointed in towards the screen. So the, the 45 degrees doesn't really complicate the right hand rule. We can just use it like that. Or we can also just imagine the components of the magnetic field and which components would create a force, which components wouldn't create the force. Okay, so he, uh, I've got a second slide in here. I just collected all the answers. So if you want to go back and look at it, you can take a look there. Let's do a uh, quiz question. Okay, so you should see that published. In this particular question, you're told that we've got an electron, so a negatively charged particle. That electron is moving vertically upwards. That's the red arrow on the little sketch here. Um, there is a magnetic field uh, that uh, is from the left to the right, that's the, um, the, the magenta or the mar maroon, a and we've got to figure out what is the direction of the force on the magnetic charged particle. Again, this is, an, a, this is a question about the field equation. Think about it this way. This is a question about our, our picture of the field equation, how the field equation works, how it relates the direction of the force to the direction of the motion in the, in the field. So I'll give you another couple of minutes to think about that. Okay, so let's just work through the solution, check we're okay with this one. The charged particle is moving <laughs> upwards towards the ceiling. So I would point my, the palm of my right hand upwards. The magnetic field is pointing towards the right of the room, so I would curl my fingers towards the right of the room. The only way I can reasonably do that is this orientation here. My thumb would point in the direction of the force, but it's the direction of the force on a positive charged particle is pointing in towards the screen. The direction of the force on a negative oppositely charged particle is out of the screen, the opposite direction. And so out of the screen is the correct answer to that problem. Okay, I wanted to look at um, a couple more examples, or at least one more example. This one is a bit more quantitative. Uh, this one is about comparing 
electric, magnetic, and gravitational forces. Uh, it's actually, in a way, like comparing uh, electric, magnetic, gravitational field equations. Above the surface of the Earth, you know, we think of it, you know, gravity being in charge above the surface of the Earth. That's what sticks us to, to the Earth. That, that's what causes us to fall towards the Earth. It's gravity that's the king above the surface of the Earth. But actually, uh, there's electrical fields above the surface of the Earth, and we've also seen there's magnetic fields above the surface of the Earth. So the, the, above the surface of the Earth is actually a landscape of electricity, magnetism, and gravity. Electric fields, magnetic fields, and gravitational fields. Now, as humans, we, we think that gravity's king or queen, but if you were a, a bee or a flea, then, you know, electricity might be uh, king. Uh, if you were an electron or a proton, again, might be that electricity, uh, like electricity and, and magnetism, are king. So, uh, above the surface of the Earth, I'm trying to say, is a landscape of electric and magnetic and gravitational fields. And um, what you experience, what you experience more or less, depends on a bunch of things. It depends on your mass. Depends, that's what experiences gravity. Depends on your charge. That's what experiences electricity. And, and depends on your, your motion, if you're a charged particle. That's, that determines the, your magnetic experience. And so um, it's an electric, magnetic, gravitational landscape. And how you, how you view that l landscape, how you experience that landscape, depends on your, your mass, your charge, your motion. All those ingredients go into the electricity, the magnetic, and the gravitational forces. Um, so we're going to take the perspective of being a, um, an electron. So we're going to imagine we're an electron in this um, electric, magnetic, gravitational landscape, and we're going to compare the electric, and magnetic, and gravitational forces on, on the electron. And so um, in this sketch here, it looks like some sort of weird a tartan kilt or something, but it's a sketch of the uh, electric, magnetic, and gravitational field lines above the surface of the Earth. So just to explain it a bit, in red is the gravitational field. So that's, that's downwards, uh, and that causes us to fall under gravity. And its gravitational field is 9.8 meters per second squared. We'll never forget that. Um, in blue, is a electrical field. So there's actually an electrical field that's typically about 100 newtons per coulomb, 100 uh, volts per meter, above, above the surface of the Earth. And so I, I sketched that in blue. And that's also downwards. And then in, uh, in green here is the magnetic field. Now, I, I'm picturing the magnetic field somewhere at the magnetic equator. So at the magnetic equator, the field streaks, you know, from, um, from the south towards the, actually streaks from the, where's the North Pole now? The North Pole is at the South Pole, so it's coming out of the um, South Pole, and out of the Antarctic, and it's heading towards the Arctic. So um, the, the field lines will be running si kind of horizontally across the ground at the equator. So it would look like these green lines here. Okay, that field strength, is uh, it's tiny in teslas. It's, it's about 50 microteslas is the field strength. So we know these three fields, and we know we've got an electron, a moving electron, in those, in those fields. Uh, we can look up the mass of the electron. Here it is. We can look up the charge of the electron and remember it. Uh, we can, we're told the speed of the electron, 6 million meters per second. And all these characteristics of the electron are going to determine, are going to govern its, um, uh, the, the forces that it experiences, the gravitational, the magnetic, and the electric forces that it experiences. <clears throat> so maybe we'll work these forces out. I'll, I'll do this on the document camera.
Maybe I'll, I'll just stick it on this side so that we can see what the, I, I've got to remember what the numbers are. Um, so, and I've got to, did I bring a pen? Yes. Let's go through these forces. So we're going to go gravity, we're going to go electricity, and then we're going to go the, the new person, uh, magnetism. So uh, gravity, Fg, field equation for gravity, I didn't really mention this, but it's Fg, the force, equals Mg. G is the field, and M is the thing that experiences the field, that's mass. So we've just got to multiply the, um, the mass of the electron uh, and the uh, acceleration of gravity. So I've just got to fill in those two numbers. 9.1 times 10 to the, no, yeah, that is the mass. Minus 31 kilograms um, times the acceleration of gravity. There's no powers of 10 there, that's a relief. 9.8 meters per second squared. And if I multiply these, it, obviously this is going to come out to be a tiny, tiny, tiny number. It's 8.9 times 10 to the minus uh, 30 newtons. So th that's the, um, the gravitational force on an electron. And that gravitational force um, on the electron, well, the electron has mass. And just like we have mass, we are attracted towards the Earth. The electron is attracted towards the Earth. So if we want the direction, I just worried about the magnitude there. The direction is down. Uh, let's do electricity next. Uh, the field equation for electricity, remember, is the, um, the product of the charge in the electrical field. The field E is carrying the electrical force. Q is the thing that experiences the field. Charge is the thing that experiences the field. The product of those two um, is the electrical force. We're just figuring out, again, here, the magnitude of the force. We'll worry about the direction in a moment. Uh, now we've got to multiply the charge. The charge of the electron is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And the field that it's immersed in, we said it was 100 newtons per coulomb. And uh, if we multiply those two guys together, we're going to get the, um, the electric force. And I got 1.6 times 10 to the minus 17. And that's uh, Newtons, because it's a force. And uh, which direction is that going to be? The field is downwards. The electrical field is downwards. If it was a, a positive particle, then the force would be downwards. Be be um, but because the um, electron is negative, then it's in the opposite direction, so that this force is upwards. And then finally, we need the magnetic force. I call that Fb. And uh, we've got to multiply, we've got to use the field equation for that. So that field equation is, I've written it out in four here, QVB sine theta. In our particular case, right, the field is towards the, on the sketch, is towards the right. The motion is out of the screen. So there's 90 degrees between the uh, motion and the field. In our particular case, just to keep things simple, this is what? Sine theta is sine 90 degrees, which is 1. Now we've just got to fill in the other quantities, the, the, the charge, the motion, and the field. So 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Uh, v is some ungodly large speed, uh, 6 million meters per second. And uh, B is some ridiculously small number of Teslas. 5 times 10 to the minus 5 Teslas. And if we multiply all these quantities together, I got 4.8 times 10 to the minus 17. 4.8 times 10 to the minus 17. And that's Newton's. And that, the direction of that, well, we can do it with the right-hand rule. The uh, velocity is out of the screen. The field is towards the right. My thumb points up, but this is an electron, so the force is down. 
in this particular case, we compared the world of an electron with our own world, we would have said that gravity is king or queen. We don't experience the magnetic force. We don't experience the electric force to any noticeable amount. But if you're an electron, if you're an electron, well, you're saying magnetism is queen, uh, it's the biggest thing that I experience as I, as I run around the surface of the